Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep and cover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, and Scott, take me to heaven. <laughs> you, you got to stop doing these intro lines, because you're stealing my <laughs> outro lines every <laughs> single time. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, Cam, it's just us this week, so let's dispense with the pleasantries and get down to business. Pucker up and tell me what we're talking about this week. Yeah, we are talking about 2001's Kiss of the Dragon, starring Jet Li and Bridget Fonda. Kiss of the Dragon? Kiss my ass. <laughs> Actual dialogue. <laughs> yep, yep. And there's plenty more gold where that came from. Um, I actually can say I had seen this film before. Same here. What's your story? See, I I think last time we recorded last week's episode, I said I hadn't seen it because I just didn't remember. But I think about halfway through watching this film, it just all came flooding back to me. There was a scene where um, Bridget Fonda's character was outside the shop and I think she had to go to use the bathroom and that whole little to-do there with, with Jet Li's character. I was instantly reminded of, of watching this around about like 2002 on you know, home movie channels or whatever. I, we had like a moment in our house where we were a big fan of Jet Li and martial arts films. So this was one of the ones... Because um, I think this came out around about the same time as The the One as well. Same year. That actually followed this one. Yeah, this was like that prime Jet Li period where um, you'd had his appearance in Lethal Weapon 4 that got a mm-hmm. lot of attention. And he quickly showed up in some star vehicles like Romeo Must Die, this film, The One. And um, I also saw the majority of his films in theaters. I think I saw um, Cradle to the Grave in theaters. I think the only one that Mm -hmm. I maybe didn't see was War. Uh, That one I think I watched on home video. What is it good for? Uh, Judging from the movie, absolutely nothing. (laughs) That was uh, completely off the cuff, everyone. That was a that was a good time. Thank you, great stuff. But um, and uh, to be fair, I didn't see this in the cinema. This is definitely on a home release. It was either a rental or it was like a movie channel or something like that. And maybe we recorded it off the TV and had it laying around the house for a while. Was this around the DVD time or had, were they still quite expensive at this point? Oh, this is prime DVD time. Hmm, maybe it was DVD. Hmm. Who who can tell? But uh, for those of you who have never seen. Kiss of the Dragon. Here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Kiss of the Dragon. Kiss fear goodbye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lu Huan, an elite Chinese police officer, comes to Paris to arrest a Chinese drug lord. When Huan is betrayed by a French officer and framed for murder, he must go into hiding and find new allies. Scott, why are we covering this movie? I I had the same question. <laughs> so, okay. I was confused as I was watching the movie because, like, um, you know, I saw this movie in theaters, um, saw it a couple times at home. I actually bought the DVD. I think we had a thing here called the Columbia House Movie Club where you signed up, you got, like, five free movies, you paid for two or three their price, and then the deal was settled. And their prices were like maybe $5 more than you'd pay in stores. So it was still worth it to get the free movies. Okay. And for that reason, I believe that's why I own Kiss of the Dragon. I don't think I would have normally have run out to buy this movie. I don't own a lot of kind of straightforward action movies. I have stuff like Terminator 2, kind of like the big ones. But I don't have a lot of these kind of more stripped down action movies. So um, my memory of the movie was fairly vague. Um, but I Googled online and they cited this movie as a spy movie. And I was like, fair enough, I added it to the list. And I'm watching the movie and I'm going like, I mean, there's definitely elements. His character has like this like um, this locker full of machine guns. Like he seems to have some sort of passport business going on that seems very spy-like. His job is very loosely defined. You know, he's going to serve in some sort of co- uh, kind of covert operation. I'm like, okay. But then they keep referring to him as a police officer. And so then I was really confused. So then I started Googling reviews online. 
And it was insane how many reviews referred to him as an intelligence agent. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, we're covered. So then I go and look at the DVD. And Scott, let me read you the synopsis from the DVD. Okay. China's top... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Does it start with Kiss Fear Goodbye? It does not. Uh, oh. It says a new standard for action. Not as catchy. Sure. Um, okay, it says China's top secret agent is sent to Paris to carry out a top secret mission only to encounter government espionage at the highest level. Which film was that? <laughs> Falsely accused of murder, he must team up with a seductive call girl. Seductive? I don't know that I would have used that seductive. term. Seductive. Uh, to save himself and her. So... Don't worry about the daughter. Yeah, never mind that. Um, <laughs> don't mention that. What the okay. hell is going on with this movie's disinformation campaign? Of If you look it up all over the place, I looked at like maybe six or seven different synopses of this movie, and at least half of them referred to him as a spy. I had, I had the same out-of-body experience watching it the first time. There's been, I think, like one film so far where we got to maybe the last 10 minutes and we're worried it wasn't a spy film, and then the spy story sort of kicked in, and we were like, oh, we're fine. Watching this the first time, I just thought, where is the spy work? He's a, he's a, he's a police officer overseas to, to like bring home an outlaw. But then I go online, like you did, and look at the reviews, and everyone's referring to him as special agent. And I think, <laughs> yeah, is this one of these like George Lucas has gone in and like edited versions of this, and now it doesn't? And, and actually, this is a very good point because we're actually speaking to the director of the film later this week, Mr. Chris Nahorn, Um and we'll put that question to him whether he thinks it's a spy film or not, because I'm genuinely curious to he hear his take on it. But yeah, I. This is the first one that online you type in like martial arts spy movies, this film comes up. Yes. And so I guess that'll be a part of the conversation about this one throughout of does this count as a spy movie? Because like the thing is, the things his character does doesn't really feel like typical police officer work to me. He feels like a spy. Yeah. Oh, well, I Maybe we're we're wandering into one of the inherent problems with the spy genre, and something that we've been asked before in interviews. Yeah, like what is a spy movie? Right. Define spy. Yeah. Define espionage. You can find you know textbook definitions of these things, but in the, in like you look at James Bond, some of these films he's basically just a hitman. Right. Or, or sometimes he is a, a spy, perhaps. But some of the films you could go through, like License to Kill, it's a revenge mission. Mm -hmm. Or we've talked about Day of the Jackal, where that's an assassin, but who's using espionage tactics and spy tactics throughout the movie to achieve his aims. Or the Taken films, which is a former CIA operative who's just out to kill people. Yeah. And I, I wasn't sure if there's like maybe like... Chinese secret police or something who use more like these types of tactics, not necessarily the acupuncture stuff, but would be more like um, operating outside of what the realm of a normal police officer is. I just have no idea because they keep talking about how elite he is. And I'm like, does that mean something that I don't really understand? Well, you have to imagine at the highest ranks of sort of police that there are covert teams and things like that, and maybe some espionage is involved. But maybe they're not what you would call an everyday spy. But then in the year 2022, what even is a spy anymore? Because most of it's done online. I don't think people are is exchanging briefcases in Istanbul anymore. No, no. And I guess we'll talk about the movie Snowden one day or something on here. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give this one a pass. I think, in terms of it being a spy film. And I mean, otherwise, this would be a very short episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a, a concern in our heads. And I guess, like, from the DVD case, uh, case about the, like, government espionage, I'm like, I mean, I, I guess there's that minister for France who seems to be on the shady side, but that's a real stretch to be writing on the back of the case. Now, listeners will know I usually read the letterbox.com synopsis for you to give you an idea of what the film is if you haven't seen it before. Cam obviously read you the back of the DVD case. I've just flicked over to IMDb, and here is the IMDb take on the film. A betrayed intelligence officer 
enlists the aid of a prostitute to prove his innocence from a deadly conspiracy while returning a favour to her. <laughs> okay. Who writes these things? Well, that's true. But, like, you think about some of the movies we've talked about on this show. Some of the ones that were, like, ultra convoluted were... They were complex to try to write out a synopsis for. This movie is not that complicated. Why is it everyone has wildly different interpretations as to what it's about? Is it maybe because our protagonist barely says anything? I do think, like, the elements of his job are very um, difficult to determine. Like, it seems very secret agent. Like, you almost have, like, a handler character he's meeting up with at a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, again, I keep going back to that um, secret um, locker with the cell phone and, like, countless machine guns. This seems odd for a police officer. I... There's two things I want to make, like, little cuts of this film, like edits, and the locker is one of them. I want to splice in a scene from Men in Black. Oh, yeah. Well, you have a, hi, Jay, or K, or whoever it was. I just want to splice that into it. I'll tell you the other one later. Oh, Men in Black 2, you mean? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Men in Black aficionado. Over oh, here. That's oh. right. That's oh. right. Get it right. Again, again, are they spy films? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair enough. If Men in Black sort of count, then uh, this sort of counts, I suppose. Well, I think the ambiguity is not really our fault on this one. It's more the film's not entirely sure, and therefore the marketing isn't sure. And so it's just muddied. I imagine a lot of people got like press kits saying intelligence officer goes to Paris to find a missing man or something like that. And then that's where the reviews got it from. I think even Roger Ebert's review references him being an intelligence officer. Yep, that's correct, yeah. But in the film, no one says the word spy. Nope. They only just say cop. Like, he says cop, mm. like, twice, two or three times. Yeah. So, uh, this one's vague, but hey, the world of espionage is not black and white. That is damn right. And that's why this is an interesting one to talk about. And it's actually our first martial arts film we've done on the podcast. There's a couple more. You know, Enter the Dragon is a really obvious one. And we will look at that at some point down the road. Um, but it's kind of like the musical spy movies. You wish there was more. And I think that we've got some Jackie Chan. Do you? Ch <laughs> I do wish there was more <laughs> musical spy movies. But we do have actually some Jackie Chan ones we're going to cover as well. But, like, I always like a diversity of spy stories where we can look at different genres. Jackie Chan musicals? Uh, no, spy movies. I got really excited there. He does do musicals, though. Does he? Yeah, I do believe he's classically trained as a singer. And there you have it, folks. Um, but I guess it, we'll pivot over to, um, you know, how did this dragon get its first kiss? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> that was not good. That was off the cuff, and I'm sorry. You should apologize to everyone for that. Um... <laughs> I, I genuinely am sorry. <laughs> So, this movie has a story credit by Jet Li. It's his only writing credit. Um, and so, I was like, well, that's curious. What did he pitch to them? What it seems like it was... <laughs> was it an intelligence agent overseas? <laughs> or was it a cop? We don't know. <laughs> so, he met with producer Luc Besson. You know, Luc Besson is a director, a writer, and a producer... He worked on the Taken films um, that we've covered on this podcast and was really well known for like La Femme Nikita, Messenger, the story of Joan of Arc, several other things. Um, he's just cranked out action movies like throughout his career, plus some oddball projects. He's also um, a figure with many allegations against him that have made him incredibly problematic to even talk about these days, as we acknowledged in the Taken episodes. But back in the 19, um, probably late 90s, he met with Jet Li. And um, Jet Li was, he'd gotten a lot of flack for Romeo Must Die. Because that movie, it was like a modest hit, but it had a lot of wire foo, as they called it. Where there was a lot of wires used for the martial arts. A lot of people kind of like floating in the air. And Jet Li, that's not what he was famous for. And he was eager to return to the style of fight choreography that had made him famous in the first place. He wanted to please more of his diehard fans, and he wanted to get back to, as he called them, hardcore action sequences. And so, in many ways, this movie was a reaction to Romeo Must Die, and I would suspect that story credit came from meeting with Luc Besson and basically saying, this is the type of movie I want to make. I don't know that there was, like, a really strong pitch. I did read some interviews with Jet Li, but nothing where he talked about a story credit. This had to have been, like you say, a little meeting idea that came up. 
because as you pointed out earlier, this is not a deep intellectual film. This is very, the story is very shallow. Yeah. I mean, it does have Luc Besson and should also mention another Spy Hard's favorite, uh, Robert Mark Kamen. Yes. Um, so they were there to, to flesh it out. But yeah, I, I, I imagine Jet Li was just a, an idea of a story and that was it. That would be my guess. And also, apparently at this time, he'd also turned down the role of Seraph in The Matrix Reloaded, um, a role that ultimately went to Colin Chow. And that role had been written for Michelle Yeoh. She turned it down. Then Jet Li turned it down. And that character is like, a, I, believe, I believe, like a guardian for the Oracle in the movie. Oh, that chap. Yes, yes, yes. I, I was I was scratching my head as to who you meant, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like yeah, Jet okay. Li was at this very curious point where like his star was on the rise because of Lethal Weapon and then Romeo Must Die, but he was not sure where he wanted to go. And The Matrix was obviously a big deal, but at the same time, uh, an important aspect of that production would be he'd have to spend six months on top of the shooting. The shooting would be about three months, but he had to spend six months with their crew where they would be copying and recording all of his moves. And he was concerned about having all his various martial arts techniques just used and repurposed by a studio. They could do whatever they want with them because they would own them at that point. And he wanted to be able to use his moves however he saw fit and have complete control over that. So that's kind of, I think, what drove him in the direction of something like Kiss of the Dragon, which is more stripped down, lower budget, but he probably has a fair amount of control if they're giving him a story credit. Well, it's not something we're going to dig into necessarily, but this film definitely feels like a European like production. It's got that sort of taken one feel to it, or like Ronin or something like that. It it has that sort of gritty European sense to it. And I imagine the budget's around about the same. Definitely. And so like this was a reunion, as you mentioned. Robert Mark Kamen came on to do joint screenwriting duties with Luke Besson. And Robert Mark Kamen, for those who haven't heard our Taken episodes, he started off his career doing movies like Taps, the first three Karate Kid films. Uh, he wrote Lethal Weapon 3. And he went on and did The Fifth Element with Luc Besson. That's where they kind of bonded. And this was actually his follow-up. Um, so he'd had a few years off since The Fifth Element, which was 1997. Um, so, like, yeah, like three years. He probably had projects he was working on that just didn't go through. That's usually the case for writers when you see a gap in their filmography. And they brought on director Chris Nahan, who um, was just like a basically student of Luc Besson's at this point. He was someone who was kind of a protege. Um, this was his debut film. There's not like an extensive filmography before this. Um, so we're going to talk to him about that as to you know how he got this job in the first place and what his background was. Um, he didn't do a lot after this that people might have caught. He did a couple um, martial arts movies. He did Blood, The Last Vampire which featured uh, Corey Yuen coming back. Corey Yuen was the um, fight choreographer on this movie, and he did the fight choreography on that film. He also did a 2016 movie called Lady Blood Fight, and then he mostly went into documentaries, and he also went and worked on daytime television. He worked on the drama Chronicles of the Sun for, um, it's been the last few years, and he's done 320 episodes. So, Jesus, that's a lot of TV. Yeah, it's basically daily, right? They've aired 924 episodes since 2018. And you moan that we do one episode a week. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> so, um, in terms of casting, Bridget Fonda, I came across an interview with her about this. She uh, signed on to this film with just two pages, really. They came to her and pitched kind of a basic idea of what they were looking for. And she had a history of playing kind of a Luc Besson heroine. Like she played the lead in Point of No Return, which was a American remake of La Femme Nikita. And she was really into um, like his female characters and what they brought to the screen that other filmmakers didn't necessarily bring. So that was all it took for her. And, you know, when she got the script, she was 100% good to go. Um, I found interviews with her. There's one on cinema.com that's really interesting where she talks a lot about this performance and they keep saying, you know, what are the similarities between you and your character? And she keeps coming back to depression and she's talking about how, you know, she was fighting depression throughout the entire shoot and was kind of shut off from everyone else. She felt very like hopeless because of this character. And it is notable. I only bring this up because like this was Bridget Fonda's final major motion picture. She would do a few TV roles. 
Um, she did a you know independent Stanley Tucci film called The Whole Shebang. But this was the last major movie, and then she basically retired from public life. And so I found it very interesting that throughout this interview, she mentions depression like three or four times. So, Is the interview post her disappearance? No, it would be on the press tour for um, Kiss of the Dragon. Okay. Interesting. I... I... I, I was going to ask you what sort of happened. I didn't really do any research into Bridget, but uh, I remember her sort of being in films. And, and one of the things I distinctly remember about this film is being a young man and seeing her in sort of those you know outfits with leather and stuff and thinking, oh, hello there. I like girls. That's fine. Um, and then never really seeing her again. So she just stepped away from Hollywood. Yep. She went to a private life. She was married to or is married to Danny Elfman, the film composer, oh. and they've had kids and just kind of had a yeah quiet life but i mean there was a period like the 90s she was huge you know for movies like singles single white female um like jackie brown so uh definitely a big talent and uh i think our loss in terms of the uh you know the films she might have made but hopefully life has worked out okay for her yeah absolutely i mean if you can step away from it and uh find something else to enjoy in life all the power to you if you're not happy change it and also notable, uh, Corey Yuen, who was the fight choreographer on this film. Um, he has a really interesting background. He's an actor, stuntman, fight choreographer, director. He directed the movie The Transporter, for example, a couple years later. I think the next year. Um, he worked on like the Jackie Chan classic Drunken Master. He did stunts in the George Lazenby martial arts film The Man from Hong Kong. Ooh, spy connection. I like it. Uh -huh. nice, one. nice one, Cam. And he became Jet Li's go-to guy um, through a lot of his American run at that period. He worked on The One, War. He worked on The Expendables, just primarily just with Jet Li. So if you watch The Expendables, he was really only working on the Jet Li action sequences. But he became like Jet Li's probably insurance policy to a certain degree of like, I want to make sure that my moves come across the way I want them on screen. So I'm bringing this guy back. And everything's safe so I can run it through with him. And yeah, hmm. that makes sense. And the only other note I found, just in terms of the production, was a scene that's in the movie where um, Bridget uh, Fonda's character is uh, being attacked by a pimp named Lupo, and he's slapping her, and Jet Li grabs the hand, and you see that character look shocked. That scene was actually a mistake. They were supposed to have a cut in there, but, um, but um, the director didn't call cut quickly enough, and Jet Li was so fast that he grabbed that guy. So the reaction you're seeing from that actor in that moment was real. He genuinely was completely caught off guard by how fast Jet Li had grabbed him. That, I mean, if there's one thing you can say about this film is Jet Li is a force of nature. So nothing about that surprises me. I, yeah. He is not a man I want to get into a fight with. Definitely. And so this movie had a budget of $24 million. So fairly low budget. Uh, domestically, it did 36.8 international 27.6 for a worldwide total of 64.4 so it's not like a huge grocer but i mean everyone walked out making money well and i i know that we in this in my household got it on some sort of home video so this feels like the perfect kind of home video film for a bunch of boys yeah these uh figures do not represent what the potential dvd sales and this is 2000 probably two this comes out on dvd that is that prime period where people are just buying everything on dvd mm. i imagine it's got a very comfortable legacy and probably still makes some money uh obviously not, uh, i think i rented it but cam you obviously had a copy so they've already made money out of us yeah and it has some decent special features on it it's got a full-length commentary um, with the director plus Jet Li and Bridget Fonda. It's that era where they're like offering you genuine value for your home uh, media releases. Uh, Matt, do you remember those days when like DVD features used to be worthwhile? Oh, I mean, it happens occasionally. They're putting out a Star Trek motion picture set that has incredible features, it sounds like, but it's so rare. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that set. But yeah, I, I, I used to reach for the special features first when I bought like DVD sets, see what's in there. But now I don't even bother. I, I don't think I even looked at the Lower Decks Season 1 uh, bonus features because I don't care. I don't, I don't want to see a laugh track of them dancing. And if you buy like a Marvel movie or something like that, it comes with like half an hour's worth of like electronic press kit. Um, yeah, clips. here's the Russo brothers telling you about the film. But just saying, like, this movie's going to be so awesome. 
this yeah. movie is bringing it all, and you're just like, whatever. So, yeah. so I, 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 maybe in those bonus features it explains if he's a spy or not. Possibly, possibly. I need to listen to the full-length commentary to find that out. Um, so this uh, landed at number 69 at the worldwide box office that year. <laughs> 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 Between K-Pax, the um, Kevin Spacey drama where he plays an alien. Do you remember that? I'm looking it up now. Yeah, so it, uh, it was one spot under that, but it beat Captain Corelli's Mandolin, the ill-fated Nicolas Cage um, Oscar bait movie that has basically just become a running joke. I think they uh, make a few uh, jokes about it in the new Nicolas Cage film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Sorry, I'm just I'm just dumbstruck by this uh, poster for K-Pax. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. uh, it's something. I'm not sure I ever want to see this film. To be fair, it's Kevin Spacey, so I probably won't watch it anyway. I think he's talking to a dog in one scene. Okay, I mean, I think I've seen it. I'd have to look that up in my... It's one of those movies that if I did, it's so forgettable that it's just gone. Mm. Anything else for us, Cam? Um, Yeah, uh, a couple just notes that uh, are also just kind of worked into the postscript here. The film was banned in China um, because its police officer character, which is named in the story police officer character, once again, muddying the waters. Um, but it was banned because the police officer character killed people abroad. That was a real no-no. And um, Romeo Must Die had been banned in China as well because of it featuring gangsters. And Jet Li actually was quite angry about this and did do some press conferences and basically said... If gangsters aren't appropriate and police officers aren't appropriate, then what type of character can there be that wouldn't start an argument? It leaves only the ancient Chinese stories to be produced. And essentially he was arguing that at that time the Chinese film industry was kind of holding itself back from trying riskier ventures. And so um, I don't really know if that's changed that much. That's I, I'm not educated enough to make that statement. But um, just interesting to hear that Jet Li back in 2001 was really trying to go toe-to-toe with their censor board. Yeah, I don't know if that would necessarily happen now, but fair play to him for sticking up for his films. Yeah, definitely. And so that sort of wraps up the the behind-the-scenes on Kiss of the Dragon. Well, Cam, you, me, men's toilet, now. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Got him! I got him! (laughs) That moment, I just definitely went... I immediately thought of, um, you know, David Lowbridge Ellis, who's been on the show and talked about how many times men's toilets are brought into spy films. And I, you I know, thought you were going somewhere else. Oh, like no, no, I, no. I, honestly. I mean, no, no, no. That's, but, you know, he's brought up, you know, how many times in Bond movies. We talked about it on the Casino Royale episode. Mm. And I immediately thought of that, of this trope of, and I think we touched upon it earlier in the in the show as well with, like, Henry Cavill with the, you know, the fight scene in Mission Impossible in the bathroom. And um, there's tons more. There's tons more. I think even in the first 100 films we've done, there's been a couple of like meetings in in men's bathrooms. Um, yeah, that's that's no surprise at all. But yeah, it, it's it's fun the connective tissue there. Though. Yeah, it's sort of like this men's world where kind of the spy business can operate. And this was a very on the nose like men's bathroom. Now <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, well let's jump right into this, I suppose. But uh, yeah, hmm. well. I'm interested to know because we both had seen this film before. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't really say what I thought of it back then apart from I remember kind of liking the martial arts mm-hmm. as as a kid. I, I suppose at the age of, I don't know, 15. I don't think I'm looking any further into a film. But uh, but now I, <laughs> um, mm, I don't really like this film that much, Cam, I have to say. Okay. Uh I like the martial arts scenes. I think they are all great. I think it has a really strong start and a really strong finish. But there's about an hour in between where I... There's just no... There's nothing going on. There's a lot of Jet Li sitting down, hmm. uh, eating, and scenes about Bridget Fonda being slapped around. Yeah. None of these things appeal to me. And so I... I watched this twice. The first time I was kind of like, oh, okay, it's fine. And I got really quite disengaged in the middle and it sort of saved itself by the end. The second time round was brutal, I have to say. Because I knew where the excitement was, so I immediately checked out in between. Now, there's a couple of other fight sequences in between. There's one on the boat that's quite cool. But really, it starts off with this this one in the hotel that's quite standout. And then the one in the police station at the end. 
the you really know the sort of the best fight sequences in the film except for maybe you could say in the sort of uh in in like the shack he's living in right. you get the old you get the old Wolverine moment which I'm sure we'll touch on again in a little while but yeah overall I can't say I really enjoyed it that much I enjoyed seeing the martial arts um I was a bit annoyed it didn't feel like a spy film for me at all particularly um so I, all I could really hang my hat on was the martial arts scenes which were sort of few and far between yeah um I did mostly enjoy this one but on like a kind of B movie level, like this is not like one of the great <laughs> movies I've watched as of late, but I think I'm kind of conflicted because I know exactly what you're talking about, where my memory of this was that it was basically like a pretty propulsive 95 minute action film. And exactly the same in my head. Yeah. I'm watching, you know, as it starts off and we get Jet Li in that hotel uh, fighting with dudes, they're pulling out machine guns, he's fighting through the kitchen and taking guys down. I'm like, this is the movie I remember. And then it, you're right, like it really slows down in the middle. And it's very um, paper thin storytelling. Uh, it's, I mean, it's spending time on character development of characters who aren't particularly well fleshed out in the first place. Like they're not just written as being very deep. So you're kind of working with cliches. The Jet Li character is presented in a lot of very dramatic situations. But like at this point, I don't know that Jet Li was ultra comfortable doing very dramatic scenes in English language. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a struggle there. I thought Bridget Fonda was borderline great in this where like, Again, you're given this cliched character. She's talking about like this girl from like, was it North Carolina or something like that? Or South Dakota? So. Something North like Dakota, that. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, talking about how, you know, she used to work on a farm and got like seduced by this, you know, powerful criminal character. And I'm like, this is like just heaping on the cliches. But the way she brings this like very jittery way of talking to people, the way she's like has this kind of hyperactive um, approach to all of her conversations and like, you get the sense of like nervousness and fear she has. I'm like, this is what happens when you hire a legit great actor and plug them into, you know, kind of thin material. It's like if you see the new Thor movie and you watch what Christian Bale is doing with Gore the God Butcher. Like, this is not going to be the great role of his career, but boy, is he invested. And that's kind of how I felt with Bridget Fonda in this movie. So I feel like that did a little more to pave over that middle section for me. But it is incredibly simplistic, and it doesn't really pick up until the end. And I thought, like, once you got to the end, it had some very inventive stuff, some very, very cool moments. Um, it is very early 2000s. There is some questionable little CG bits. There's some digital slowing down of the camera where you get to see some kind of blurry, you know, fists and stuff like that, and feet flying in the air. Um, but... When I think of a lot of the movies of that era where they were real like hack and slash martial arts movies where like often the action was kind of incoherent, this one delivered enough that I walked away content, even if like kind of like you alluded to earlier when you were giving your thoughts, it's kind of icky at parts in the same way that Taken was icky. There are very similar themes going on here and similarly icky. Yeah, there's a there's some drug use in the film and not necessarily consensual drug use mm -hmm. um i wouldn't say it's necessarily done tastefully but i wouldn't say it's distasteful either it's just kind of matter of fact it is done in a way where the actors are really capturing the reality of it like bridget fonda plays the hell out of that scene and checky cario maybe the most evil character we've ever tackled in a spy movie um they are making that moment feel real, but at the same time, I'm asking, why are they? Why are the filmmakers making me watch this? <laughs> it's just a far cry from like Barbara Carrera as as a nurse at Shrublands giving the uh, the injection to the the Patachi chap, like time for your medicine, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's very on the nose, kind of campy. This is a lot more serious. I don't mind either. I didn't have a problem with taking too much either when it comes to that. I know you find it more uncomfortable, which is entirely fair enough. Um, there's a couple of other things that I find a bit weird about this film. But yeah, overall, I get what you mean. I totally agree. I think the, the martial arts sequences are very well shot. And yeah, there's some trickery going on. There's a little bit of wire work, I think, in the office police station bit at the end. Um, I believe they had to use wire work for the tall blonde dudes. Um, okay. There was a couple yeah. moments there. Yeah. The twins. Yeah. 
Um, but I, every, every single time a fight broke out, my attention was instantly snapped back into the film. It's just anything in between, I just found myself drifting. And they've talked about how, like, uh, I believe Jet Li said, like, he wanted to make a movie that was important from a story point of view, not just martial arts. And I think he cracked the code a little better a few years later in the movie Unleashed, which was also known as um, Danny the Dog, I believe, depending on where you lived. And um, that one, I think, captured, like, I don't know, more of a character drama element stronger than this one. And I do think it is, I, I can't go back to it, but I really think it's like Jet Li's not quite fully confident in English language performances like this. Like he's, a lot of Bridget Fonda's performance, I wonder how much of it, the sort of like jittery self-talk she has going on is almost to like mm. make up for the fact she doesn't have a strong dramatic actor to bounce off of. She is the only energy in the scene. It, one of my notes about Jet Li was it kind of reminded me of George Lazenby in a sense. Well, I think George Lazenby had more skills. Yeah, in terms of acting, the Jet Li does maybe not with the martial arts, mind you, but Diana Rigg was acting around George Lazenby and mm-hmm. trying to make him look good so much so that they fell out. Bridget Fonda is is acting around Jet Li, and one of my detriments we can get into it later is I I just think he hasn't got the chops at this point for a dramatic role, and I think a different actor could have done a lot with the drama and the story in this but not necessarily the martial arts. So it was a trade-off to make the martial arts look more realistic. I can say that I'll come out of this remembering some of the martial arts sequences more now I've watched it again. I don't think the story is deep enough that you, even if they had a better actor in place, that you would still remember the the story because it is really quite bland. Yeah. You could stick, I don't know, George Clooney in this film, and I still probably wouldn't remember him carrying... The, the woman into the hospital to like help yeah I, that it's just so boring it, it's whatever so i guess they made the right choice yeah i think honor majesties is a great comparison because like bridget fonda is kind of a little too classy for this movie a little too high wattage like this role doesn't demand like a really strong dramatic talent and this movie is as we said like it's a lower budget martial arts movie they could have easily cast someone else the fact that you know Bridget Fonda just like four years before is working with Quentin Tarantino on Jackie Brown has a very long you know history as a movie star she's bringing that and I think they needed that because I think the movie is a lot better with her if they'd cast someone else you know a flavor of the week or something like that this movie I I can't say to this day it has a rich legacy but I think it would be even more ignored with a lesser talent yeah, absolutely. I, I did want to talk about the legacy of this film. Maybe we'll circle back to that at the end. Let's talk about some things that we did like. Yeah. And I'm, I want to start us off with someone I haven't really spoken much about, but it, Bridget Fonda. Yeah. I'm fond of her. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. I, I'm sure a pun that's been used a million times before. But yeah, I, she is, for me, the only thing that, as you said, kept me interested in between the martial arts sequences. And it's interesting hearing from you that she sort of sought out this sort of Luc Besson-esque female lead role. She wanted to tackle something like that. Um, Because a lot of people might think it leaves a lot to be desired for an actor. I think it's really interesting in the world of like these Luc Besson action films where like they are kind of like meat and potatoes action films that maybe we don't hold in a particularly high regard. But when you think about it, for a long time now, they've very much put women front and center in these strong action roles. And obviously, Luc Besson's, uh, you know, whatever issues are going on with that guy, I I don't know, but, like, it makes it more complicated to talk about that Mm -hmm. now. But, like, when you start to, like, think about it, you know, you've got Mila Jovovich doing a number of films for him, Scarlett Johansson doing Lucy. You go, you know, all the way back. You've obviously got Bridget Fonda saying, you know, she was a big fan of what he was doing. I, I wonder how much of it just had to do with the fact, like, he offered roles... Regardless of how high you rank Luc Besson action films, he was offering roles that just did not really exist that, you know, that frequently in the mainstream. No, I think I think that's a fair point. I think you know, offering something that they can't necessarily get elsewhere is is an important aspect, and it's why I know actors tend to gravitate towards these sort of auteur directors. Not comparing Luc Besson to anything like that, but like David Lynch films is going to give you something a bit different than you're going to get from a Spielberg 
And so actors will tend to try and gravitate towards these act- these directors because they're going to get different things to play. Um, I I don't know much about Bridget Fonda's other films, except for the ones I have seen, but I don't know what her range was when she was acting, if she got to try other roles, or if she was sort of pigeonholed for a while as a particular type of character before this. Um, I mean, she was pretty versatile, uh, but I would say, like, around the time of this, it felt like post-Jackie Brown, which should have been, like, a bit of a, you know, mid-career launch. Like, because you have her, you know, when she's quite young, doing stuff like singles and stuff like that, where she really blows up. And then you get, you know, maybe a couple slower years. Then you hit Jackie Brown, which she's fantastic in. I'm kind of surprised she wound up, you know, in, like, Kiss of the Dragon. But also, like, um, she did the movie Lake Placid a couple years, I think, before this, which was the killer alligator movie. So it doesn't feel like she was getting offered the best material either. You've got to think a lot of people just want to do roles where they have some fun. Yeah. Like, I don't think Sam Rockwell's turning up to Charlie's Angels 1 for the material. True. It's more like I get to be a villain and dance around. Yeah. Although he was fairly small time at that point. So for him, that was a bit of a breakout role. And also, you know, most of Bridget Fonda in this film is her being injected with drugs. Yes. Yeah. That That is, that is accurate. Yes. Mm-hmm. But... She manages to deal with those problems and perform in a way that actually she's the standout actor for me in this film by a country mile. Despite some other sort of fun, campy villains, this, she has the most energy in this film. She's definitely the heart of the film. Yeah. Um, so I, I, when I think back on it, I'll, I'll remember this film for its martial arts sequences and Bridget Fonda. And like Chucky Cario is like kind of an absurd villain. But, like, the scenes he has with Bridget Fonda are really tense. And that is those two actors really bringing their A game. Mm-hmm. What do I know him from? Um, like, I know that's a very broad question because you don't know what I've ever seen. But, like, I saw him in this film and I was like, I know this guy from something. But I briefly looked at his IMDb and I can't place it anywhere. So, like, he was in La Femme Nikita back in the day. So that's the Luke Besson connection. But, um... He was in the movie The Core. Uh, he was in the Mel Gibson movie The Patriot. Angelina Jolie film Taking Lives. Um, he's one of these guys who, like, I can't say that there's, like, a large number of incredibly memorable Jackie Cario performances that jump to my mind. But he's one of these guys who's, like, just been an ongoing character actor I see pop up all the time. He was in Goldeneye, apparently. Oh, he was. He was um, uh, Pushkin or Mishkin, whichever name they went with. Mishkin. Who was that in the film? Was he one of the ones at the table, the, the sort of Russian table? Yeah, he's the one that Oromov, um, like, I believe shot later in the movie or something. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. There we go. Got it. But yeah, my like was Bridget Fonda. I think she's, uh, she's, a, she's a corker. Best performance in the film. Yeah. What about you? Well, let's talk about some of the martial arts sequences. Because this is one sure. of those movies with lots of martial arts. Which ones worked for you? What were the ones that excited you? Um, I really liked the bit in the laundry room at the bottom of the hotel and also in the laundry chute. I thought they looked really cool the way they did that and that was all practical, I would yeah. imagine, except for maybe the, the fire was CG, one would Correct, imagine. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, he was kicking those guys around that laundry room. He threw that guy into the washing machine and, like, did that all practically and it looked it looked vicious. But the two moments that really step out to me is one, I briefly mentioned it earlier, which is sort of the Wolverine shot with the chopsticks. Hmm. and then stabbing it right into that guy's neck. That was brutal. <laughs> that was, like, really interestingly directed, where it seemed like he was on a dolly or something and being wheeled into frame. Like, he wasn't moving. Did you notice that? I didn't, no. It didn't look like he was walking. It looked like he was floating. And I thought that was really cool. What, when he, when he was, like, attacking with chopsticks? Yes. I'll go back and look at this now. Interesting. It's a really cool shot, and I look forward to talking to the director about that shot because it's really memorable. It was one of the moments that when I went to rewatch it, instantly I was like, oh, I remember this sequence. Um, and what was the other one you were going to name? Oh, it's just the, um, the the office cubicles with the twins, and he drops yeah. that one guy on his neck and, and like pile drives him into the floor. Another really sickening crunch. And it's like visceral when you hear it. What about you? Yeah, um, I thought that twin fight was incredible. The twins were played by Cyril Raffaelli and Didier Azoulay. And um, 
I'm surprised they aren't actually twins. That actually is a bit of a surprise to me because they look a lot alike. They're even dressed the same. Did you uh, notice they look exactly like Stamper? Yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah, weird. And they have that little technique where like one guy holds someone up and the other one does this like <laughs> calibration of his kick <laughs> leading up to it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like pretty crazy stuff. But like that whole fight I thought was incredibly well done. And sometimes in this movie it falls back on the kind of the gimmick of characters who can just vanish, which I find a little eye rolling when characters do that in this movie. It's like they're almost like horror movie villains just like vanishing without a trace. But like that fight scene the way it's staged and how brutal it is. And I love that it shows that Jet Li's character is really smart because he like boxes that one guy in so he can't actually kick. His legs are dis disabled by how close quarters the fighting is. Moves like that I thought really worked. I also, like you, really love that fight in the laundry room because it had something you don't see in a lot of action scenes nowadays where it's like there's gags built in it's him grabbing the irons and the guy's punching the irons and he's burning his hands and then you cited the throwing him into the the open laundry uh, machine you don't get that as much when i think of the takens it's fast takedowns and like you know neck breaks or you know shootings or and whatever guns yeah guns yeah are used. this is this is very gun free for jet lee yeah does he have a fire gun um i don't think he does no, I don't think he does. And yeah, you know, speaking of like funny moments, you, you think about the twin fight again. You've got the moment where Jet Li is like slapping the guy and doing the old like this hand here and punch him in the face. And I, this is a this is an audio podcast. I should be should be describing it better. He's uh, trying to trick the twin by holding his hand on one side and then punching him with the other to try and deflect it. But uh, yeah, it looks really quite funny on screen. And that bit where the two guys are like doing the you come forward, you come forward, and they're doing it back mm. and forth. It's like some good comedy, but. A lot of these movies nowadays don't have like these like built-in gags that like make action scenes really fun. Because um, I think of the John Wicks, I really like the John Wick films. I'm not slagging them, but like they don't have kind of these like fun moments of like building up. Although I guess th part three did. I think of that horse sequence that actually had some really cool moments. But um, yeah, and like the the sort of knife fight bit after was quite fun as well. Yeah, maybe I'm just not remembering well enough. But like. It, it was such a staple of these types of movies in this era where they would mm. factor in all these kind of little, you know, kind of beats that would pay off a uh, individual character fight. Um, I also really loved the uh, <laughs> police officer martial arts school. Uh. <laughs> uh. What was uh. that? <laughs> I love that it's like the next room, like you walk into the front office of the police station and the next room, they're all in like gi training. With billy clubs. With billy, yeah, with billy clubs, exactly, got their batons out. Um, I, I, I laughed at that and I wrote down in my notes, why is it in martial arts films, everyone knows martial arts? That is an excellent question. And I mean, it starts off absurd and it only gets more absurd, but like that moment where it's like three guys swinging batons and Jet Li dodging all three of them with his own baton, mm. and incredible, like incredibly well staged. I thought that was so awesome. But you know what's crazy? I was looking at that scene and I thought, like, this is exactly what they did in Matrix Revolutions, right? With the Mr. Smiths and Neo. But this is practical. It looks better, yeah. They didn't need to do that. It looks a lot. I mean, I don't think uh, Jet Li would be spinning on the pole and then flying out of the scene. Yeah, uh, but it's interesting that they chose to go so like digital with with revolutions, whereas this is all practical and I imagine far cheaper. Uh yeah, far lower budget. Yeah, I mean, there's like the odd, as we said, like the CG fire effect. Or you get like that moment of trickery with the dude who's blown in half in the vent, and you see like the legs slide down where it's kind of like the you know half of the body kind of stuff. But like outside of that, there's not a lot of special effects in this movie. No, it, and that's actually queuing me up for my next like is that and i mentioned it earlier that sort of european gritty grimy feel that the film has it's almost like a noir detective story in a way like it's, it's, it's walking around at like night time with street lights and everything and everything's got this sort of green tint to it like it just looks i wouldn't say it looks cheap no. they, they've gone for a particular vibe with it it's definitely a decision taken has the same kind of vibe yeah yeah, and obviously that's both at the Luc Besson school. I, I haven't seen La Femme Nikita, but I wonder if that's got the same sort of thing going on. Yeah, we'll have to tackle that one further down the road. Mm. 
but yeah i i just i like the vibe of the film right that's that's more the like in itself than the way it's visually portrayed on screen obviously the martial arts is great but they're trying to create this environment of this man feeling out of place from his homeland and like every everyone in france is after him and same with the bridget fonda character as well she's also completely isolated and it has that, you know, we tend to think of like France and these, and, and Paris, I should say, in these very like romantic terms. It's the city of love and all that. I've been and there. the way they, I don't, <laughs> and the way they convey it here, it has that kind of like, kind of foreboding, kind of dangerous vibe to it that I thought was really effective. It's what I always uh, imagine Vancouver feels like. Um, depends where you go in Vancouver. <laughs> That's, <laughs> not, fair. That's uh, fair. Not inaccurate in some places. Hmm. Um, any other likes for you, Cam? Um, there was things I enjoyed. I don't want to say they're good, but they took me back to a time and a place, Scott. The, um, rap music soundtrack, which, like, when the NERD song Lap Dance kicked in during the fight with, like, the big bruiser guy, I was like... I'm an outlaw. Oh, I was like, this is ridiculous. This is so 2001, but I kind of love it. Mm, It... I, I wrote down the um, I wrote N E R D Welcome to the Naughties, and uh, it felt like it, it, I I had this down as like a dislike and kind of a question at the same time. When you have this specific sound to a film, does it date it? Because I think Triple X, the first film, has the same issue. Yeah, it does date it. It really, really dates it, and I'm okay with it. Well, I mean, we're we're both trying to relive our youth constantly. We're both creeping closer to that uh, that final dragon kiss. That's true. Um, another element I liked was actually just seeing Bert Kwok, who um, you know played the um, whatever you want to call him, the guy who ran the Chinese food store uh, slash restaurant, who was his contact, who has this you know bit where he talks about how he's taken in five agents and four have died again. What's going on here? Secret agent or police, Scott? This guy's taking in multiple police officers who are undercover? I don't know many police officers that go overseas to do work. Like covert work. Like surely, surely you run out of like jurisdiction when you leave your municipality. It seems strange they'd be just lending this guy um, to go help. Well, okay, you're skewing onto my first dislike. Do we want to go down this well, alleyway? Uh, let me just talk about uh, old Bert here. Um, we've, you know, covered Bert before. He uh, was uh, Mr. Ling in You Only Live Twice. He played a Chinese general in Casino Royale 67. And he was also in Bullet to Beijing. And he's just one of those character actors who I think is um, legit awesome every time he pops up. So, you know, props to him. Um I also liked, just a small note, was you have the two Chinese uh, representatives, I don't even know what their jobs are, who come to investigate what's going on with Jet Li's character. And they meet with, um, you know, Jackie Cario's inspector character and the French minister. I like that those two characters are smart. They are hearing what, you know, is being sold to them. And they're like, this guy's one of the best. This doesn't make sense. This is confusing. And there's never a sense that they are not kind of aware that this is shady. Yeah, there's, they, they're not particularly trusting of the French authorities. And uh, they know their man. Yeah, it was nice to see. Uh, I can't remember the name of the chap who like had the meeting with him on, on the boat. Right. But that was another fun martial arts sequence there as well. And I, I, every time I watched this, I forgot he got shot. Yeah, no, that's true. Did you notice, though, on that boat fight sequence, that when he's up on the roof of the boat... They are doing everything they can to obscure um, showing that he's actually, like, up on a roof. Like, they are not showing a faraway shot. It is entirely a camera shooting upwards, which leads me to believe they did not shoot it on top of a boat and are trying to trick you into thinking it was. I think you've just written another question for Chris later in the week. (laughs) I think so. I think so. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents... Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources, whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right, as you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, 
home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? It's commentary time, and we are tackling 1966's Our Man Flint. It's going to be groovy, far out, happening, and so much more. We're going 60s style, baby. And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. Um, well, I, I queued it up before, but I think in terms of dislikes, my major one is this plot has quite a few holes in it. You don't say. I know. <laughs> shock horror. Uh, I mean, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a martial arts film, a low budget martial arts film from the noughties. I shouldn't be expecting too much here, mm-hmm. but can anyone tell me why Jet Li's character is even in town? No, I cannot. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you <laughs> next week. I guess this... Okay, so it's like this Chinese gangster who's operating in France. So there must be some sort of crossover there. Like maybe they were pursuing him in China? Uh, I, I don't know. I I have no idea. They don't give you a lot of information here. He lo- He looks like he's too busy chasing heaven to be doing any gangster stuff. My favorite part is actually when he is stabbed by the sex worker. And he says... I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> that made me laugh. It did. It made me laugh too. There's other things that don't make sense. Like, Checky Cario's character, um, Inspector Richard, or Richard, um, this character, <laughs> can you explain to me how this guy is managing to operate in the shadows? There's no shadow. <laughs> Apparently, he controls the entire police force of Paris. <laughs> because he sends them all going at Jet Li. And Jet Li takes them all down, by the way. Credit to the man. But why does he even try to kill Jet Li's character? I do not know. It's crazy. And like, What's he's, the plan he, here? He is gunning down his own people. Like, just yeah. willy-nilly. Like, in that hotel, for example. I'm like, really? No, no witnesses? I mean, they're really... Maybe, like, you know, I was saying that the back of the DVD case, how they're talking about, like... Um, you know, um, corruption at the highest level. I mean, maybe that's the corruption. Just this guy is able to apparently just operate with complete immunity. Uh, we see a scene later where he's in like a um, like a tunnel and he's just like opening fire with like bystanders around and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, this guy is paper thin. And they're talking about how this gangster who's killed at the start of the movie had a contact in France. How anyone could not realize who this contact was, this mysterious contact, is insane. That they've also sent people to in the past. Yes. Baffling. This guy's running everything. He is like, um, you know, injecting um, sex workers with heroin. He's apparently overseeing this entire like human trafficking operation. He apparently is working with a gangster. This guy's very busy. He is, he is the ringleader of all crime in Paris. He also happens to be the head of the police in Paris. Did you ever see him doing police work? I mean, apparently, in Paris, police work <laughs> is criminal work. They are they literally just chase <laughs> themselves around the town. It's crazy. Like, you think about a lot of the things we see him doing in this movie. This would take up a lot of time. You'd think he would just have, like, <laughs> lieutenants that would be handling all of the dirty business. Because, like, this guy gets his hands dirty a lot, literally. We see him, you know, in our introduction, just beating a guy to a pulp in a restaurant with his bare fists. And it's like... I feel like he would have other people doing these things for him so that he could operate in the shadows. <laughs> and and also, but he has, not only has he got this like ring of prostitutes, uh, I'm guessing some sort of drug ring yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but he also has a ring of, well, maybe they're spies or people in disguise at least because there's this whole chap, the whole character played by Paul Barrett who in the, it's in the credits just says pilot who meets Jet Li's character right at the start Oh, yeah. Um, he, he, uh, it was a, with a proper British accent. You you knew in town. Oh yeah. Oh China. I love China. They have chopsticks, and and then eventually he then turns out to be working for the guy and pulls out two machine guns and shoots up the entire hotel lobby with staff around. Um, so he had to maintain this chap 
and have him wear a disguise and put on an accent and pretend to like check if it's Jet Li. I I guess is he the one that gets hit with the billiard ball out of the pocket? He is. Great shot. Oh, that's incredible. That's actually if you buy the DVD, which <laughs> I recommend everyone go out and track down that 2001 Wait, DVD. Does it does it come with a billiard ball? It actually the disc. Oh my god. Is a billiard ball. Oh my. <laughs> Back when they cared what was on discs as well. That's right. Look that's at right. That. I I know, but like the villain is absurd in this movie. And so it's like this is a movie that like you can't start to pick apart this script. You just can't. Like it's it's basically just a clothesline for action sequences. So Right. Yeah. You said it. You've set me up for something. It was a note and you've set me up. Okay. In the past you have said comedies are a basic plot just to hang gags off of. A martial arts film's the same. Mm-hmm. Just in the, the that's a yes, yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I I'd never really noticed that as a, I'm not really much of a martial arts film fan. I was when I was younger, but I wasn't really paying attention to plot at that point. Um I'd be interested to see when we tackle a few more if it really is literally just sort of a a threadbare narrative that they can just have cool stunts on. I mean, a lot of the Jackie Chan films, it was pretty basic. Like it was just kind of a setup and then extended action sequences. Why would you ruin the tuxedo for me? I can't speak to the tuxedo. I'm thinking more of his films he made in China that were like incredible and way better than anything he made in America. So those are the movies I'm thinking of more so. Oh, now you definitely ruined the tuxedo for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I have actually. Sorry. Oh, Sorry, tuxedo oh. fans. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, another noughties film. Um, but a dislike for you, Cam? Well, I guess for me it does kind of just fall into the sluggishness in that middle section. Like there are sequences where it's like gently escaping and going through like a tunnel system and stuff that I'm just like, eh, like this feels kind of like pedestrian, almost like time filler. It's like you have some incredibly well-constructed martial arts sequences in the movie, but then you get a lot of kind of filler like that. And you get a lot of like the real unpleasantness in this area where it's like Bridget Fonda being slapped again and again and again. And I'm like, okay, like again, like, different sensibilities in a 2001 movie. I don't think they would uh, shoot this material the same way in 2022, but it's not particularly pleasant to sit through. Um, and I found it, as we said up front, it's icky, but like, I almost feel like I found it ickier now than I did then, even though then I did find it disturbing. I, I mean, I think you're just older at this point and, and wiser to the world and, and people's experiences around you and maybe care a bit more about your common man than you did when you were 20. How dare you say that about 20-year-old Cam, the most thoughtful of all people. <laughs> Tripping old ladies up at the shopping center and stuff. Classic yeah. Cam. Um, no, I, I know what you mean. I Again, I didn't have the same problem with Taken that you did, but I, I get why they do it in the plot. It's meant to make the inspector look like an absolute like jag. Like He's, he's not a kind of guy you want to hang around with. He's yeah. not a very nice guy. But you do it once. Yeah. But he does it several times. And he has a henchman played by, find the chap's name, Max Ryan. Great name. Character name Lupo. Not so great. And he's he's beaten the tar out of uh, out of Bridget Fonda throughout the film. Yeah. Also, I just realized that her character name is Jessica Kamen. That's got to be a nod. Yeah. I actually noticed Cayman on the... Um, I didn't catch that it was her last name. I should have connected the two. But I noticed when they went to the orphanage to find the daughter, um, they looked up Cayman on the registry. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little thing for people paying attention. Nice yeah. little touch, though. Yeah. Um, and then, like, I, another thing that didn't fully click is the relationship between Jet Li and Bridget Fonda, where... I can kind of buy just the connection of like two kind of lonely people in France who don't have anyone. I'm willing to go along with the movie, but like, that's why we talk so much. That's right. Exactly. Right. Um, but like a lot of their dialogue together is pretty wobbly. Uh, it's a lot of just her talking about her daughter and him kind of staring blankly or in one moment that has not aged. Well, it's a little bit of gay panic stuff where she's, mm -hmm. you know, asking him if he's gay and he, you see that Jet Li is not having it in that moment. Oh no, Jet Li would not sign off on that one, I don't think. Um, 
I, 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 I admittedly giggled at that little exchange. Like, are you gay? No. Yeah. I'm not, no. How dare you? No. <laughs> the, I, the more I see these 90s films, the more I see this gay panic. I do, uh, I do find it quite interesting how, how quickly everyone had to assert their masculinity and say they were straight back then. And I also wonder, in 2001, would they have presented him as a viable romantic lead for her? I don't think so in 2001. This is, this is, I mean, Jet Li is my utter dislike. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of unfair to put him as a dislike because I don't think he's coming out the gate saying he is a tip-top actor. But he's saying he is a tip-top martial artist. I buy that. Yeah. But any scene of, like, emotion between the two of them, it's like, it's like Bridget Fonda is acting against a wall. Right. It's he's just stoic the entire time. I think you get like a little smile out of him right at the end. But apart from that, that's basically it the entire film. Now you make you make movies all about characters that or like TV shows like The Mandalorian. He's behind a mask the whole time. He's not emoting particularly. Right. I get more emotion out of The Mandalorian than I do Jet Li's performance in this. I don't remember Romeo Must Die very well. But I would be curious, and I'm not going to go back, but if I were to go back, how um, well conveyed the romance between him and Aaliyah is in that movie? My guess is it's along these lines where a lot of it's just kind of this unspoken, kind of underdeveloped stuff going on. Well, ages in the field, Cam. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. What have I done? (laughs) Cam must die. (laughs) No, that, that's a different thing. I'm just chanting a mount, mantra. Yeah. yeah. But it was like, we're, we're seeing a change, you know, with actors like, you know, Henry Golding um, or, you know, Simu Liu in like Shang-Chi. But for a long time, they would not present Asian male actors as viable romantic leads in North American films. And I do think that is very much at play in this movie. But you are meant to feel that there's some sort of connection between them that's romantic. She goes in for a kiss. I feel like the movie's resolving it at more of this, like, friendship. Oh, by the end, I think it resolves there. But, like, there is a moment where she does go in to kiss him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I... mm. Not buying that one. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think I'll go back to the point I made earlier about having a better actor in the film versus someone who could do better stunts. Looking at it now in in twenty twenty two, you know, in the rearview mirror, are you happy with having Jet Li in this film, or would you rather have someone perhaps not as good at the martial arts but better at sort of the pathos? You know what? I'm actually happy with Jet Li in this movie. Um, you know, obviously in terms of dramatic lifting, you know, not great, but like to me, it's. I think it probably is my favorite of his american action vehicles like i really didn't like that many of them i saw you know almost all uh, pretty much all of them unleashed i would have to revisit because i do recall that one being decent but um there's like a fierceness to the martial arts in this movie that i really appreciate that was somewhat absent in his other stuff where it was a little more cg heavy or wire heavy um and so i mean it's kind of a case like jackie chan where it's like if you want to see great Jet Li movies watch his Chinese language films like they are you know the best martial arts movies he made but I think in terms of his American work this is the best one well that's me for dislikes and likes taken care of do you have any final notes Cam? I've got a few um let's talk about the needle death at the end which is built up the acupuncture stuff again this is very secret agency that like he has this like bracelet of needles that he uses at key moments um, which I thought was actually a great gimmick for the character. Mm-hmm. And when he does the titular kiss of the dragon at the end of the movie, it does not disappoint and major bonus points to Cheki Cario for sputtering and like just salivating all over the place and then hitting the ground. Uh, he, he went all out in that scene of him dying. I, I mean, just as, as a gimmick itself, the acupuncture thing, I think is, it's like, it feels like a Q branch special. It's like, it's, it's a really cool thing you don't really see. I, I don't think I've ever seen it done in any other film since. Nothing that jumps to mind. And I like how he uses it both as a weapon and also to help people. When Bridget Fonda is in distress and he's going to go get her daughter, he like, you know, puts one in her neck to kind of let her relax and sleep in the hospital. Like, it's kind of this all-purpose tool he has, but 
there is that deadly kiss of the dragon. He's always got that up his sleeve, literally. I mean, that moment where he like <laughs> inserts into the back of Cario's neck with his like lips. I'm <laughs> like, that's amazing. <laughs> Has there ever been a moment in your life where you wish you had that skill? Um, like the kiss of the dragon, or just in terms of the acupuncture? Just the acupuncture skills. Not yet, but maybe like one day when I have more aches and pains. Yes. Oh, you're you're thinking more of like a self treatment kind of thing. I think that that guy is a whiz. If you have like you know a sore shoulder, he has it cured in a second. <laughs> you, you come you come downstairs to, to have breakfast. You're like, oh, I'm ready. Oh, oh, thanks. Cheers. All right. Yeah. Cured. All good. All good. I don't I don't have problems sleeping, so I don't really need it for that. So I think it would just come down to like yeah wounds. I, you see, there's there's a couple of times in my life I feel like I wish I could have had those just to shut people up. Mm, fair. Me? You, you got... <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I was just going to stick a pin in your shoulder and uh, take care of it that way. I'll be really watching myself in Las Vegas. <laughs> He's seen me come at you with my mouth. It's like... Mm. <laughs> at the back of my neck. I'm like, uh-oh, yeah. uh-oh. <laughs> Kiss at the dragon cam. <laughs> I start gurgling. <laughs> <laughs> That's just when you see me anyway. <laughs> um, Another note. Tied to the Cario character, this man has a pet turtle, perhaps a tortoise. Mm -hmm. In the opening of the movie, they are showing rabbits or hares. What is going on with this visual metaphor? I That was one of my final questions, was what's going on with these rabbits and the turtle? I have no idea, because like... like the, the rabbits at the start, there's like two nice rabbits, and one's been like eaten. Yeah, like it's, it, it reminded me of like um like blue velvet at the start when you're seeing underneath suburbia and there's all the maggots and things like that. Yeah, but this is this is not a David Lynch film. Um, yeah, I I don't understand why the turtle was here at all. Because like you think of the tortoise and the hare, the moral is that slow and steady wins the race. I would not describe Jet Li as slow, maybe steady, but not slow. The middle of this film is slow. That is true. Did it win the race? That's the question. Well, we'll answer that in a couple of minutes' time, I think. And I like that they take the the, tur the tortoise or turtle or whatever and release it on the lawn of an orphanage. Yeah, sure. Good luck, tortoise. I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> smash, smash, smash. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. Is, is it going to like survive? Is that like a uh, woodlands area where this uh, turtle can go to? Or is it just like on a front lawn? The uh, The weird genesis of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. In Paris. Ooh. Yeah. I like that. Stick an acupuncture needle in it, and it turns into, like, Leonardo. Uh-huh, yeah. Mm. The, the spin-off we never got. <laughs> Kiss of the Turtle. <laughs> the sequel. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only note I had left, and I kind of set myself up earlier, was uh, connections to things. And this is a connection to On Her Majesty's again. Okay. So... In the orphanage, and I said I wanted to make another cut, a little cut to this film. So I want to make a clip. Hopefully, I'm going to put it on YouTube. In the orphanage, uh, Jet Li is walking in uh, with Bridget Fonda to go find the, the, her child. Right. And Bridget Fonda rips the covers off of her bed. And for a second, I was like, I wonder if Irma Bunt's there. <laughs> uh, I just want to make that little clip and put it online. Wasn't in Honor Majesty's Layson be arranging pillows to make it look like he was in his room? Well, no, it, when he does that, he turns up to see the, the lady. Well, I know the, the scene you're talking about where he goes yeah. in and she's there, but isn't he doing that within his own room as well? Before yeah, he he's leaves? making it look like he's in there. Yeah, he is. Okay. Which is strange. But uh, yeah, just the idea of Irma Bunt being in this film did make me laugh. So we've had two connections to Honor Majesties now with Enter the. Uh, sorry. Enter the dragon, kiss of the dragon. There's a lot of dragons. Also, two weeks in the row of of the. I thought of that as well. We could have had eye of the dragon and uh, <laughs> kiss of the needle. Oh, it was. It was like kiss of the needle. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Ooh. Oh my god, there's a needle connection here. We didn't even do that. That's right. So uh, we're saying Jet Li studied under the teachings. Of the same, actually, that, that would not connect at all. No, that's <laughs> not, not Nazi Germany and China. There's no connection there. No, no, no. And I don't know that Donald Sutherland would have been uh, training Jet Li. If anything, it should have been Jet Li training Donald Sutherland. 
Also, uh, <laughs> Donald Sutherland's needle had very different effects on people. Than, also uh, true. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. D- Donald Sutherland's well known for his needle, but uh, far more damaging. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a euphemism. <laughs> it may have been. It may have been. Okay. Um, well, that's that's actually me for the notes. I haven't got that many left. I think we sort of covered everything. Do you have anything left, Cam? No, I think that kind of wraps me up. Really. Um, maybe I'll just kind of wrap up the film discussion with like I mentioned this earlier. Is Checky Cario the most like loathsome villain we've seen since we've started this podcast? I don't know that there's many that really, because you can look at like the Bond villains and they're, you know, they're want to like destroy the world or whatever. But like, this is evil on a level that I don't feel like we stumble across too often. I'm dramatically pausing because I'm trying to think of an answer. Now, the the villain in Taken 1, which this has a lot of connective tissue with, also quite despicable. But who is the villain in Taken? I suppose it doesn't really have, there is like a, there's like a, Sheik isn't there at one point. He's at the end. He's going to be the one that's going to buy her, but it feels like there's just a lot of people all tied into this, you know, sex trafficking ring and take. And it's not like there's a yeah. mastermind who's running everything the way there is here. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of some other things. I mean, like some films had like Heinrich Himmler in it. So that's true. I, I, the, well, yeah, um, we had Hitler op- as well. Operation, yeah, we also had Hitler. So we've got some pretty <laughs> despicable people. Okay, let's um, correct it to fictional characters. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. Pivot there. We'll pivot there. I'm trying to think of some other films we've done. It's been over a hundred now. I know. Wow. It's a tough it's, ask. I barely remember yesterday, Cam. I have to say, the villain in Taken Two was pretty loathsome. Hmm. Um, I suppose because this has got that sort of gritty, like, disgusting feel to it. And not all of the films we do have that sort of horrible feeling, and some of them are a lot more glossy. And so the villains aren't particularly as loathsome because they're meant to be for kids. Yeah. Like, I don't think um, Floop is going to come up on a list of worst villains alongside this chap. No. And it's a case where it's like, they want you to just hate this man more than anything humanly possible so that you get that satisfaction of seeing him die in a unbelievably over the top way. So And he keeps the turtle in a drawer. Like that's that's some pretty crappy thing to do. I feel like that's a subtle addition to how awful he is. They're like give you all the stuff that's in your face crazy and then they also just throw in animal abuse just on the side. <laughs> I I don't really care about humans that much, but animal abuse, oof mm. you're going in my bad books, I have to that's say. That's right. Well, speaking of bad books, <laughs> Kiss of the Dragon, is it making the knock list? Can. Is it a spy film? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was say, is this a spy movie? I think the fact that we. Ha- well, hang on, hang know- on, hang on. Have yeah, we yeah. come down on an answer on that question? I mean, my answer would be if it were like more spy centric. Like if Jet Li's character was defined as a spy in this movie, I would still say no. I don't think this movie is strong enough to make the knock list. I think it's a solid martial arts film. Um, it's got some really cool little moments. I think Bridget Fonda gives a good performance, but like, this is kind of a B movie. And so if you're into these kind of down and dirty action films, by all means, enjoy it, but it's not a knock list contender. No. And I mean, for me, I I intend to put the question to Chris later this week. Uh, the episode will be out Friday, but at the time of recording, we're actually interviewing him a couple of days after the review, which is rare for us. Usually we do the interviews before. So I'll definitely put that question to him and try and get his take on the spy thing. But for me, I'm not sure it is. Yeah. I'm really not sure it is. And even if it were, as you said, Cam, I don't think it's enough. Uh, it, there's some great fight sequences. Some of the best fight sequences we've had on this show. Top-notch stuff. And we've had Bond films you know born films all kinds of good stunts this is some top-notch stunt work here but is it a spy film no therefore is it making the list of all-time spy movies no here's a question which do you prefer this or taken because they're both you know luke Besson produced films we're going to tackle a lot of luke Besson produced action films on this show so we've only done a few but yeah which do you come down on which do you prefer I think I'd sooner watch Taken than I'd watch this. I think I prefer this one just by a hair. <laughs> a hair. A rabbit. <laughs> ah, oh. ah. Um, I think Taken is just slightly more level. 
like the pace is very level throughout. It's not like it has a really great start and a really great end and like this void in the middle that just bores me. Taken maybe doesn't have the, the highs of this when it comes to fights. Right. But it is consistent throughout. It's more of a consistent film. It's more propulsive than this one. Uh, this one, yeah. I agree. Like it has some pace issues. I think I just come down on the side of like the action in this one is more memorable to me than Taken. I, you know, we recently covered Taken. Uh, we did a film commentary for it over on the Patreon, so we're pretty up to date with Taken. And I would still rather go back to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, there you go. Two no's. We're not even entirely convinced that this film is a spy film, but do hang around to Friday. Check out our interview with the director, and we will throw that question to the man that made this film. Uh, but two votes. It's not making an Oculus, and the dossier on Kiss of the Dragon is complete and filed as classified. Question to you, Cameron. What are we doing next week? We are going back to the 1960s and kicking it with Vincent Price once again for Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. I... um. I had some fun with the first Dr. Goldfoot film. I can't say I had a ton of fun with that film. I I think I'm still living inside that chase sequence in San Francisco. I think uh in terms of it, I think it's still running. I think I've left my screen on downstairs still showing it um since we recorded that. But I'm keen to see what the immediate follow-up is like. I think it's like the next year. Yeah. Um I'm admittedly a little worried about what is often deemed a lesser sequel (laughs) that's not a prospect that fills me with uh (laughs) excitement but we'll see how it is hey you like the first film ah this one Eh, it's okay we'll find out uh we've got a great guest joining us a returning guest uh from the team over at spyberry so your mission should you choose to accept it is to check out dr goldford and the girl bombs and join us next week uh, if you like what you hear on the show please consider leaving us a five star review wherever you get your podcasts and uh, do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week listeners do remember i don't sell shrimp chips shrimp chips